Well, good morning. So, <clears throat> last week, we began our series working through Jesus' Beatitudes in order to try and understand the upside-down nature of Jesus' kingdom. You see, because the kingdom that Jesus came to earth to establish is a kingdom that looks different than the world. Because it is a kingdom that thrives and exists not in the right side up, but in the upside down. And it does this by turning worldly expectations and a worldly way of viewing and understanding life upside down. And so Jesus began his description of his kingdom last week by saying that it is the poor rather than the rich who are blessed and will get to inherit this kingdom. But then Jesus moves on to say maybe the most odd and otherworldly statements in all of the Beatitudes when he says, second, blessed are those who mourn. And I say that this may be the oddest of all of the Beatitudes because it's a very strange thing for us to say that those who mourn are blessed. Because we don't feel very blessed while we're mourning. When we lose a spouse, or a parent, or a child, in those moments we do not feel very blessed. When we lose our job, or our house, we don't feel very blessed. When we're diagnosed with cancer or another ser serious chronic illness, at that moment in our lives, we do not feel very blessed. Because none of those things are easy to deal with. They all take major adjustments in life. We have to adjust to no longer living with that person. Or no longer being able to call our parent whenever we just want to talk to them. We have to adjust maybe to a new job. Or adjust to no longer bringing in and having as much money as maybe we once had. And we have to completely adjust and rearrange our lifestyle in order to deal with the new health difficulties and diagnoses that we are dealing with. And so in these moments, we don't feel very blessed. And then we begin to think and memorialize and mourn over the past. We mourn as we think about the times that we had with that significant other that's passed. Or the short amount of time that we had with our child. We mourn over the days when money wasn't an issue. When we didn't have to wonder how the bills were going to be paid or where our next meal is going to come from. We mourn over the days when we didn't have to worry and think through every place that we go, everything that we say that we're going to do as we gear our lives around the health issues that we're now having to struggle with. And so we miss and we long for the way that things used to be as we mourn the situation that we found ourselves in. And so in these points in our lives, we don't feel very blessed. And when I think about the idea of suffering, of mourning, of hardship, I can't help but think of the Apostle Paul. Do you remember how Paul described his life in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? 
in defending his own apostleship against false super apostles. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Paul, on account of his service to Jesus Christ, suffered more hardship in his life than most of us can even imagine. And so I would imagine that while Paul was being beaten, or stoned, or shipwrecked and floating out in the sea, or while Paul was hungry and starving, while Paul was living on the streets, when he was dealing with an anxiety attack, I imagine at those points in Paul's life, he didn't feel very blessed either. So how can a man like Paul, who has gone through everything that he has, say about God what he does at the beginning of 2 Corinthians? If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open up with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And notice how Paul begins this letter to Corinth there in verse 3. Where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. How can Paul still say something like that? Well, it's because Paul knows the second half of Jesus' beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Paul knows that no matter how bad the suffering or the loss or the pain or the persecution, Paul knows that God is there to comfort him. Notice the rest of this passage. Paul opens up 2 Corinthians in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Paul begins here by blessing God. And the concept of blessing God has a rich history in Israel. For example, David, at the time of his death, blesses God for being faithful to give him a son in Solomon to take over the throne. In 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 48, David said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. And even the king of Tyre, 
blesses God for his faithfulness in bringing about Solomon who will get to build the temple that David had longed to build. The king Hiram says in 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 12, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son, who has discretion and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. And in chapter 6 of 2 Chronicles, Solomon himself, once he has found the place to build the temple, says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he has promised with his mouth to David, my father. So what you can see is that at the heart of Israelite blessings of God is a thankful appreciation for God's faithfulness, for God's commitment to follow through with His promises. And so Paul begins his letter here to Corinth by blessing God. Because he knows that because God is the God of all comfort, that God is faithful not just to be there with Paul in the midst of his suffering. And not just to provide Paul a happy feeling while he's suffering. But Paul knows that God is faithful to provide a way of being. A way of living for the Christian that makes suffering obsolete. Paul knows that those who identify with Christ in his suffering by suffering on behalf of Christ because of their Christian faith will get to also receive comfort in Christ. Paul knows that no matter how much suffering and hardship abound, that God's comfort will superabound in the midst of that suffering. But Paul's satisfaction within his hardship, within his suffering, within his trials, is not just in the fact that God is there to comfort him, but it's also found in his knowledge of how that comfort is to extend past him and into the lives of other people. Paul is content with his suffering because he knows that it enables him to comfort those who are going through similar things. You see, because we live in a broken world, suffering and hardship are going to occur. But yet, when we find ourselves facing bad and difficult times, we act like we're surprised. But you see, we shouldn't be surprised when a broken world begins to act like a broken world. It's like the man who makes the decision to enlist in the army and goes off to war. And in the middle of battle, he comes running back to his sergeant crying and saying, I don't want to be here. I didn't know they were going to be shooting at us. But what did you expect? That's what happens in war. And the same thing is true with our world. Because our world is broken, because there is sin in the world, because the world is fallen, we have to expect that suffering and trials and hardships are going to occur in our lives. However, as Christians, no matter how bad life may get. When we lose our spouse or a parent or a child, when we lose our job or our house, when we're diagnosed with cancer or another serious illness, no matter how bad life may get, we can have comfort in the kingdom of God. Because God is the God of all comfort. God has always been faithful to provide for His people, and He will continue to be faithful because it is in His very nature to comfort us in the midst of our struggles. 
And so step one is that we must look for comfort in God in the midst of the struggles that we find ourselves in. Because we cannot find comfort in God if we don't look for comfort in God. And if we will look to God for our comfort, we can have confidence that God is faithful to be there with us and to bring us through our struggles and that God is faithful to one day deliver us from this broken world of sin to a place where we will no longer have to worry about those things because it is in God's very nature to do that. However, one thing that we must remember is that God's comfort is not a happy feeling that He provides to us in the midst of our struggles, but it is a way of being. God provides us a way to live where we are content with any circumstance that comes our way. No matter how dark our life may get, because we know that God is walking right there beside us. I'm reminded of the words of King David in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There was a person one time who said to another individual who was suffering, suffering colors life, doesn't it? And the sufferer responded, yes, but I propose to choose the color. That is the life we have in Christ. God does not just make us happy in the midst of our suffering, but He provides us a way to live, a new way to live in the midst of our suffering, a way where we can trust that God is walking right there beside us, and therefore it's not our suffering that colors our life, but we make the decision to color life with the comfort that God provides. However, I think that maybe the most important thing that we learn about suffering from Paul in this passage is not how we find comfort in God in the midst of our struggles, but what the ultimate purpose of that comfort is. Because God does not comfort us for our own sake, but He does so so we can show that comfort to others. God's comfort is not intended to stop with us, but to empower us to comfort other people. And so step two is we must look for others to comfort. Because you see, each one of us has a unique story. We have all suffered in a multitude of different ways. Therefore, each one of you is an expert in something. If you have lost a spouse, a parent, a child, even though it may not feel like it, you're an expert in that. If you've lost a job or a house, you're an expert. If you have or currently battling cancer, 
or another serious chronic illness. It may not feel like that now, but you are an expert. Each one of us has a unique story. And your specific story makes you uniquely qualified to comfort someone who's going through the same or similar things that you are. Because God does not help us to overcome our circumstances so we can keep all those things to ourselves. But He does so so that we can use our experiences to help other people who are going through the same or similar things that we are or that we have gone through. But we cannot help others unless we are looking for others to help. You see, the reason that those who mourn are blessed is because they belong to a God of comfort. Those of us who have made the decision to be a part of Christ's upside-down kingdom are blessed when we mourn and suffer because it causes us to rely on a God that is faithful, faithful to comfort us, faithful to be walking right there beside us in the midst of the darkness. A God who is faithful to, prov- to provide us with a new way of living that makes that darkness, that makes that suffering obsolete. A God who is there to comfort us. Not to take us out of everything that we suffer, but to be there with us in the midst of that suffering. And so rather than looking in all kinds of different worldly places and all kinds of different people for comfort, when we struggle, when we're in the midst of those dark points in life, we must run to the great comforter. However, we cannot forget that God's comfort is not ultimately for our own good. But it is so that we can comfort those who are going through the same or similar things that we are or that we have. You see, the blessing of those who mourn is twofold. We're not only blessed because we receive unmeasurable comfort in God, But we are actually blessed because our mourning, our suffering that we face in life equips us to help other people who are going through the same things that we have. I don't know if you understand how great of a blessing that is, but the way that God works in the midst of our struggles is not only to help us, but He actually uses our struggles to help us in order to help other people. God is working in the midst of your life right now, no matter how dark things may be, not only to help you, but someday so that you can help someone else. And that day may be today. That person may be the one sitting right next to you. God is not working in your life just to help you, but to be seen and to shine through your darkness to bring light to other people's darkness. And so we must be on the lookout every moment of every day to bring the comfort that God has blessed us with into the lives of other people because we will not find that person that God is trying to use us to shine in their light if we're not looking for them. God can walk them right past us and we will not see it if we're not ready to find it. We must be on the lookout for those we can help. Let's pray. Dear Lord, God of all comfort, we pray to you and we thank you for the life, for the empowerment, for the comfort that you give us. We pray for those who are going through dark seasons in life, that you will bring them comfort and that you will walk right beside them, that you will empower them to live in spite of that darkness. And we know that you're faithful to do so. Lord, our prayer is that we won't run and hide from you when we struggle, but that we'll run into your open arms to receive comfort from the only one who can truly provide it. And Lord, our deepest prayer is that 
We will use the ways that you have comforted us in the past or the ways that you are currently comforting us and walking beside us in our lives to be a light in the midst of the darkness of others. That we will constantly be on the lookout for those people and we pray that you will bring them into our lives because we know that you're working in our lives now not only for us but that one day we can be your light to others and we pray that we will see it and that you will bring it to our knowledge to our recollection so that we can be your shining light in someone else's life. We can show to others what you have done for us. Lord, we'll thank, we are thankful for your Son because it is in your Son and in his kingdom that we receive this comfort. And in his name we pray this morning. Amen.